Build an altar of acacia wood, three cubits high. It is to be square, five cubits long and five cubits wide. Make a horn at each of the four corners so that the horns and the altar are of one piece. Make a bronze basin, with it a bronze stand for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Make a table of acacia wood two cubits long, a cubit wide, and a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Make an altar of acacia wood for burning incense. It is to be square, a cubit long and a cubit wide, and two cubits high. Shalom, shalom, and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry. I'm Yosef Ben Avram, and you've joined me today for part three of the Schoolmaster, and I've entitled part three, The Importance of the Shadow. Now, if you haven't listened to part one and part two, then I urge you to stop this teaching now, go back and listen to part one as well as part two, as this is a five-part series, and in part one, we spoke about the importance of the schoolmaster and we defined the word schoolmaster. We under, came to understand that the word schoolmaster is better defined as guardian. That in the ancient time, there was a guardian assigned to either the son or the daughter to help them to come to full maturity of age. And we saw how important it is for us to understand how the schoolmaster functions to point us to Messiah Yeshua, so that we may grow up into Him who is the head. In part two, we had a look at the seven trips of Moshe, and we spoke about how many times he went up and down, and all that happened during those different events as he went up and as he came down. And we came to see that it was on trip number seven that he was given this temporary covenant of the sacrificial system and the Levitical priesthood, that it was a temporary solution to atone for the sins of the people until Messiah Yeshua came. That was all that was added to the original. But at the same time, we came to see that there is no cookie-cut division of Yahweh's Torah. Yahweh's Torah, His instructions, His guidelines, was never meant to be made into a book of the covenant and a book of the law. Now, as we continue in part three, we're going to dig a little bit deeper and we're going to look specifically at the concept of the new and the old covenant. As many people today are saying that the new covenant and all of its fulfillment has already taken place. And we need to take a look at what has been fulfilled or what has been implemented and what is still to be fulfilled regarding that new covenant. This is very important because if we misinterpret this, then we will think that everything else has already happened and we'll begin to apply scripture incorrectly and we'll start to become, as I've said before, an immature people. 
So brothers and sisters, before we start, let's pray. Father, we want to praise you and thank you. We want to give you glory and honor. And we want to say thank you, Yahweh, that we can come together in this manner. I pray in the name of Yeshua Mashiach today, Father, as we sit, as we discuss, as we get around your word, Father, as we do this teaching, I pray, Father, that you will really be with us and that you will strengthen us. Father, that your spirit within us will well up and that every preconceived idea will be left aside and that we will come, Father, with a heart to receive with, 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 a, with a mind, Father, that wants to learn. And Father, that as we come into your presence, I pray, Father, that you will be made real to us and that the words of my heart and the meditation, Father, of, of, of my heart and of my mind, Father, will be acceptable unto you. We thank you. We honor you, Father. And I also want to pray a special blessing of each and every person that has joined us. Father, so many people come and they listen to these teachings and I just want to pray in Yeshua's name over each and every one of them. Father, that they will receive what you have in store for them. Father, that they will receive what you have in store for them and that you will bless them in the wonderful name of Yeshua Mashiach. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, as I always say, I urge you to bring your Bibles with you because it is very, very important to have it with you and to follow along, not only on the screen, but also in your Bible and to make notes and to look at everything that is being presented to you today. Now, we've come to see in part one the importance of the schoolmaster as a guide to maturity. And we spoke about the earthly tabernacle as a picture of the heavenly, which in essence is actually Messiah Yeshua. And this is very important to understand because Moshe was told to make the earthly tabernacle according to the heavenly, according to everything that was shown to him upon the mountain. We know that Messiah Yeshua came and he walked upon this earth as the living tabernacle. So everything that goes on in the earthly tabernacle has a purpose, it has a foreshadow, and it points us to Messiah Yeshua. We need to remember this and we need to learn how to apply the correct signs and the correct symbols and, and to take what has been given to us and correctly interpret it. Now furthermore, we've come to see that those who hold to the Book of the Covenant versus Book of the Law teaching are in reality holding on to an idea more than a reality. And because of this, they are finding all kinds of verses to support their doctrine, as we have shown from the previous couple of teachings on this specific subject. We've already looked at Colossians. We've already looked at Ephesians. We've already looked at Hebrews chapter 7 and Hebrews chapter 9. We've also gone into a complete overview of this doctrine and had a look at every single scripture that they have used to present their doctrine. And we've come to see that many of the scriptures that have been used have been used um, by twisting the truth. And brothers and sisters, that is a dangerous, dangerous place to be. The truth of the matter is that this teaching of Book of the Covenant versus Book of the Law, it lacks in substance as well as specifics. Now let me explain what I mean. It lacks in substance in the fact that it doesn't tell you how many laws are found in Book of the Covenant. It also doesn't tell you which specific laws are found in Book of the Covenant. They only seem to tell you, oh, but I do the same as you. I keep Shabbat, I keep the festivals, you know, I do all the things of kosher, so forth and so on. But what they're failing to see is how many Torot, how many laws are found in Book of the Covenant. And many of them are not even following what is found in the Book of the Covenant, let alone following all of Yahweh's Torah. Now, what needs to be understood is the importance of Torah and its relation to you and I. In other words, to those that walk by what it says. We have to define and we need to understand the importance of Yahweh's Torah. In the teaching on the golden calf, I explained that Yahweh's Torah is so much more than just laws and guidelines. It's the very will and character of a loving father. It is that which he wanted to put in our inward parts right there at Mount Sinai. Because it was who we were supposed to be. So that we could be a kingdom of priests. And to be a kingdom of priests means that you are reflecting the one who is the ultimate. Which is the creator of the entire universe. Which is Yahweh himself. That's why when his law is on our inward parts. We become a true light to the nations. Now if you have your Bible with you. Please turn with me to the book of Isaiah. Chapter 8 and verse 20. And we're going to look at a very important passage of scripture. In Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. In Isaiah chapter 8, 20, it says the following. To the Torah and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. 
Some passages of scripture are translated to say because there is no daybreak in them, because there is no light found within them. So many people today are speaking according to the testimony of Yeshua, but they are denying that they need to keep the Torah. Others today are keeping the Torah, but denying the testimony of Messiah Yeshua. We need to have the Torah and the testimony if we are to be the children of light. Now in part two, we came to understand that the same laws, in other words, the same laws, the same decrees and the same statutes that Abraham kept was exactly the same as what Moshe kept. If you haven't listened yet to the teaching called What Was Before Moshe, then I urge you to do that. And I will put a link in the description to this specific teaching so that you can link to it and get that teaching. You see, the same decrees, the same statutes, the same ordinances, and the same judgments that Moshe kept is the same that Abraham kept, and vice versa. Yet Moshe was made lawgiver, and he was given the sacrificial system and the Levitical priesthood as a temporary solution. Why? So that the people could come and present their offerings to Yahweh, so as to make atonement for each sin that they committed. This was out of Yahweh's grace. And so many people today that hold to the Book of the Covenant, Book of the Law, they, they look at the Levitical priesthood and they say, oh, but that was imposed. But when you look at it in the eyes of, of, of Scripture, and you look at it from the beginning to the end, no one can deny, brothers and sisters, that it was given out of grace. Because right there and then, they should have all died. This is so important that we put it in the correct perspective. Otherwise, we will have a twisted theological understanding. Now, what we need to also understand is that this temporary priesthood, this temporary solution for what had happened, was never meant to be so that we could now all of a sudden come together and make a cookie-cut division of Yahweh's instructions. That was not what Yahweh wanted. Both the sacrificial system and the Levitical priesthood has been superseded by Yeshua, who is the ultimate sacrifice. And his priesthood that is eternal and everlasting is the one that endures forever and ever. And that is the priesthood that is standing today. Yet we are not to make, as I said, a cookie-cut division of Yahweh's eternal word to suit our theological understanding and thereby twist the rest of scriptures. You see, the problem today is that many believers still don't understand the importance of Torah and the role of Yahweh's Torah in their lives. We need to understand that the Torah instructs how a holy people belonging to Yahweh are to live and act and think, especially as a community. Now, like I've said before, up until this point at Mount Sinai, up until the point where, where Israel was out in the wilderness and they were in Egypt, Yahweh had not dwelt among them as a community. So here at Mount Sinai, brethren, what he is wanting to do is he is wanting to dwell among them as a community. And that is why Yahweh's Torah, His guidelines, they instruct us how to live, how to act, how to be around other fellow brethren and believers as a community. Because remember, like I said, that before the covenant at Sinai, Yahweh had never dwelt among His people. This is very, very important to understand. That is why the Abrahamic covenant is different to the Mosaic in the fact that Abraham was given these promises, but now these promises were becoming a reality with the people that Yahweh had promised Abraham would come from him. Furthermore, what we need to understand is that the Torah shows, it shows you and I how to love Yahweh and worship him. It also shows us how to love our fellow brethren, and that is the duty of a priest. The priest is supposed to serve Yahweh and then supposed to serve the people. So within Yahweh's Torah, as we walk it out and as we walk it through his Ruach, we begin to learn how to worship him and we begin to live and move and have our being in him. And thereby we live peacefully with him and our fellow brethren in a righteous, just and conscious manner not selfishly not manipulatively but in the right way that Yahweh wants us to live because his instructions are not burdensome his instructions are being given to us to live and move and have our being in him and to be a community that bears the image of the one whose law and Torah it is furthermore brothers and sisters his Torah is administered with mercy and it provides a way for reconciliation. That is why the fivefold ministry and the apostles and everything that they taught, they were called the messengers of reconciliation. Because Yahweh's Torah, when it is administered, it is given by mercy and it provides a way for reconciliation. It provides a way back to have that image restored within us. 
but it becomes our judge when Yahweh's people fall short of walking in the ways that is being prescribed within the pages of Torah. You see, the testimony of Yeshua is what was prophesied through Moshe, and we spoke about this in part two. It was prophesied through Moshe that a man would come, that a prophet would come that would be far greater than him, and that he would be raised up, that he would resurrect, and as such he would reign as king and high priest in the order of Melchizedek, that he would be the branch the branch that will unite the house of Judah and the house of Israel into one stick, into one tree, if I have to put it that way. And this is what we spoke about in part two, that Moshe received this understanding that there would become a prophet far greater than him that would reconcile all things in his flesh. You see, Yeshua would be that prophet to come and he would reconcile everything. Why? Because He is the living tabernacle. He is the true heavenly pattern that Moshe saw on the mountain. And He would come to earth to fulfill everything that was spoken about. You know, the scriptures testify that Yeshua will deal wisely and that He would execute righteousness and justice in the land. Furthermore, the Torah shall go forth from Him. Can you imagine that? Yahweh's Torah, the very Torah, brothers and sisters, that so many people today are wanting to to make a division of. His Torah shall go forth from him and justice will be a light to the nations. This is why we need to conform to the image of Yeshua. So that by doing this, we might be a light and a person who conforms to the image of the great magistrate and thereby we will be able to execute his righteousness by his Ruach upon this earth. But how can we do that if we hold to a false division of his instructions? A false division of Yahweh's word. Because we misinterpret scriptures that say that we are to rightly divide the word of Yahweh. So we come and we take it and we make a scissors cut through it. Yet that is not what Yahweh says. Yahweh says, I want you to correctly interpret my scriptures so that you are not a child but that you become a son and a daughter that is not tossed around by every wind of doctrine, that is not knocked around by every single kind of teaching. You know, brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us that we shall know them by their fruit. And it's actually speaking of wolves in sheep's clothing and false teachers. And Yeshua said that you would know them by their fruit or you would know them by their lack of fruit. You see, when we come out of the church or when we came out of the church, We were very quick to speak out against those who spoke of the testimony of Yeshua, yet did not uphold His righteous laws. Yet today we have others that speak about Him, yet they hold to a false division of Scripture that strips from the importance of holiness, righteousness, and it misinterprets most of the New Testament Scriptures. Brothers and sisters, the fact remains that the Scriptures are clear that those that do not hold to Yeshua and His testimony as well as his instructions, that they reveal that there is no light in them, as found in Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. You see, it's only those that speak and teach Yahweh's Torah, as well as the testimony of the living Torah, which is Messiah Yeshua, who is the manifest name of Yahweh. It's only those that speak and teach this. They are the ones, the true ones, that reveal that they actually abide in the branch. And thereby, brothers and sisters, all men will be able to see the fruit of light. Why? Because they are abiding in Him. We need to be very careful that we don't fall short of what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. It says, Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. If we are teaching others to break Yahweh's Torah and His commandments, we are in danger. But whoever does and teaches them, those who walk according to his ways and teaches others to keep this as a form of of holiness and righteous living, such a person shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. You see, to produce the light from above, in, in order to have the very presence of the king, you cannot have the Torah and reject the testimony of Messiah Yeshua. And you cannot have the testimony of Messiah Yeshua and reject Yahweh's Torah that will go forth from him in the end of days. That is why there will be those who will be the greatest in the kingdom and then there will be others that will be the least because they chose to just be saved and never walk in Yahweh's guidelines and instructions so as to become a son and daughter of inheritance. 
Today we have another problem. We have many people today that are struggling to understand the understanding of what is commonly referred to as the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And it's imperative that we fully understand this. You see, if we don't want to see the importance, or if we don't want to fail to see the importance, is a better way of putting it, if we don't want to fail to see the importance of the shadow, then we need to understand that everything that was done in the beginning is a type and foreshadow, and that there is, there is a way that we need to look at Scripture in order to understand what is still to take place. That is why Rabbi Shior said, do not forget the acts of the Exodus. Don't forget what happened in that, in that entire time period. Because everything that happened to them is going to be a reminder for us so that we are not disobedient children. Now according to Jeremiah 31.31, 31, it says the following. It says that Yahweh will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Who is he making the covenant with? The house of Judah and the house of Israel. Very, very important to understand. And he goes on and he says, The new covenant will not be according to the covenant that he made with, his fa with their fathers in the day that he took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. His covenant which they broke, although he was a husband unto them. Now, brothers and sisters, in the new covenant, what we need to understand, and we're going to get it, we're going we're to look at this, new covenant or renewed covenant. And, and, if it is new, then has it already been completed? Has every single aspect of the so-called new covenant already been fulfilled? That's something that we need to look at too. You see, in the new covenant, what we need to understand is where his law, where his Torah shall be written. It shall be written upon our hearts. And what many people do not know is that right at the foot of the mountain, right at the foot of the mountain at the Mount Sinai, is that Yahweh desired to put his Torah in the, in the inward parts of his people. He wanted to take that marriage ketubah and put it in their inward parts. Yet we know that they feared, brothers and sisters, and they drew back. Their hearts were the issue. Their hearts were not circumcised. Their hearts were covered over with fear. You know, today many are teaching that the book of Hebrews is speaking of a new covenant. They use that passage of scripture and they say that it's a completely new covenant. But the truth is that, that it has many new and better aspects to which I agree. It does. It has many new and better aspects. Yet we need to understand, as we have proven from previous teachings, what the writer of Hebrews is actually trying to convey. You see, the importance of what the writer of Hebrews is trying to bring to our attention is that there is a new mediator between Yahweh and Israel. In other words, the mediator before was Moshe. Now the mediator between Yahweh and the people is Yeshua. He is our great high priest. And he is the mediator of this better covenant. That is very, very important to understand. The parties have remained the same. It has to. Because the covenant has to be between Israel and it has to be between Yahweh. It's not a new covenant. It's not new parties. It's a new mediator. Yeshua becomes the mediator. And how does he mediate this covenant? He mediates it through his life, which he laid down for us. This is very, very important to understand. See, at Mount Sinai, the people's hearts were as hard as stone. And for this reason, Yahweh could not write his Torah in their hearts. Instead, he wrote it on tablets of stone, which is so symbolic. Why? It's symbolic of their hearts. The people were fearful, they were stiff-necked, and their eyes were focused on earthly things, and they were led by the desires of their flesh. They wanted the food that they had in Egypt, and each time Yahweh revealed his power and might, what did they do? They quickly forgot, and Rabbi Shul tells us, do not be like them, because they quickly forgot, and they murmured, and they complained, and they went to whoring and rebelled against Yahweh. You see, brothers and sisters, because they were so carnally minded, just the same as so many believers today, the reason why they cannot become sons and daughters is because they are so carnally minded. It was for this very reason, because they were carnally minded, that they could not understand the heavenly and the spiritual principles that Yahweh was wanting to convey to them. And like I said, this is still a problem with many today. Many people are saved Yet they cannot understand the deeper mysteries and understandings of Yahweh's workings. Because they are carnal and fleshly, messing around in their lives, yet they claim to still be saved. 
brothers and sisters, we need to understand something. Yahweh will not share that which is holy with that which is profane. He's not going to give to you the jewels of his kingdom into the hands of somebody who is defiled. That is why it says, Psalm 24, Blessed is he who has clean hands and a pure heart, for he shall ascend the hill of Yahweh. Matthew tells us, Those who shall see him shall be those who are pure in heart. It's a heart matter, brothers and sisters. It's not a knowledge-based matter. It's a heart matter that we are to deal with. It was a heart matter then, and it will still be a heart matter at the end of days. You see, brothers and sisters, his spirit could not dwell with them. His spirit could not dwell with them. That is why he instructed them to build an earthly dwelling place for his spirit. That's why, as we saw in part two, he had to separate himself from them. And that earthly dwelling, that was patterned after what exists in the heavenly, which was after Messiah Yeshua himself. And it was a copy that was intended to lead them to the real thing, which was that prophet to come. Yeshua, the true tabernacle. You see, since their minds were set on earthly things, they were so unable to comprehend the heavenly principles, that which was in the heavenlies. It was, it, was, it, was, it was Greek to them, if I have to put it that way. So instead, he gave them an earthly tabernacle with earthly furnishings, which we're going to look at in part four. And I'm so excited to get into that because that is, that is something that I really, really enjoyed. He gave them an earthly altar, and he gave them earthly priests and earthly judges. Why? Because they were so fleshly. Because they were so fleshly and they were so filled with fear, they couldn't comprehend the heavenly things. Why? Because they were still a profane people. They couldn't understand the order of Melchizedek. And they couldn't understand what was existing in heaven. Today, so many people talk about the Melchizedek and priesthood, but they are walking around defiled. Let us not be, brothers and sisters, as we were when we came out of the church, learning to speak everything that we can, learning to speak the Hebrew and say all the right words, yet our hearts are far from Yahweh. And we lack the fire of His truth and the fire of His presence in our lives. Now in Leviticus chapter 26, we see that in this specific chapter, we understand and we come to see that He highlights again the covenant. And, and as we need to note which covenant Yahweh will remember after the children of Israel confess their sins. In other words, when they repent from walking contrary to Him, and when, when they come to Him and ask for their hearts to be changed and they are humbled, when they repent of their sins, it says that He will remember His covenant with Abraham, His covenant with Isaac, and His covenant with Jacob. And He will remember the land, the inheritance. He shall remember it. You see, brothers and sisters, it's critically important to note that the covenant made with Abraham and the covenant made with Isaac and the covenant made with Jacob, that it was different. In, in essence, it was. It was different to the covenant that he made with the children of Israel. And the question is, what was different about it? You see, in the covenant made with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the question that we need to ask is, where was the Torah written? Where did his Ruach dwell? And who were the priests and ministers of reconciliation? Who ministered unto Yahweh? You see, in the covenant made with Abraham and with Isaac and Jacob, the other thing that we need to ask is, who served as their judge? Who served as their magistrate? You see, because they obeyed the voice of Yahweh, and they walked in His ways, and in the same time they learned to die to their flesh, I believe that the words that Yahweh spoke to them were not just words that went in their head and out the other side, but instead it was words that became engraved upon their hearts and that His Spirit abided with them. And I believe that Yahweh Himself became their judge. Just as it was in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, so too it was with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Yahweh was their judge. And this is how things are meant to be today. We are supposed to be walking in this manner. Yet not everyone chooses to walk in this way at all. Instead, people today choose to walk in compromise, in half-heartedness, in selfish gain and ambition. You see, the way Abraham, Isaac and Jacob lived, it doesn't strip away from Yahweh's Torah. 
No, it brings it all together and it doesn't make a cookie cut division called Book of the Covenant, Book of the Law. Instead, it shows you and I how now in this renewed covenant, how we as the children of Yahweh have a better hope because now we are able to walk in this this manner, as our father Abraham did. Why? Because we have the promised Ruach that now abides within us and helps us to be a living testimony of the one who we have been called to look like, Yeshua himself. You see, brothers and sisters, this covenant, this new covenant, will be more like the covenant that he made with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob, this is why many people do not seem to understand the same principles, in other words, the same Torah, the same instructions, guidelines, ordinances of his kingdom that was given to Abraham existed in every single covenant. And it will exist in the Abrahamic and the Mosaic as well as the Davidic. They build on one another. This is so important to understand. And this is why the understanding of the various covenants is imperative to our maturing process. Many today that are teaching this division of Book of the Covenant, Book of the Law, they teach it, but they fail to show how each covenant builds on the previous because they put all their eggs into the Abrahamic covenant. And they don't seem to see the rest. And furthermore, they don't seem to even want to tie the shadow of the heavenly together with the covenants and how that all relates to spiritual maturity. You see, what differs between the so-called old covenant and the new covenant, so to say, was where the principles of Yahweh's kingdom, in other words, where his laws were written, and where his spirit dwelt, and what order of priests and judges ministered to Yahweh and to the people. Today, we are supposed to be having his law written on our heart, but that shall only be accomplished at the end of days. We are striving to be Tamim. That is why his law has been written on our hearts as we surrender to him on a daily basis. And Yahweh has raised up new priests, priests in the order of righteousness, just like the disciples and the fivefold ministry to do what? To bring everybody to the same level of understanding and to the head, which is Messiah Yeshua. This is what's changed. But we don't understand these things when we start to chuck out parts of Yahweh's word. You see, before the Exodus account and the giving of Yahweh's Torah to the children of Israel, the same principles of Yahweh's kingdom, in other words, the same Torah existed. And there are many hints from Genesis all the way through to Exodus chapter 24 that Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that they knew the principles of Yahweh's kingdom, the very principles of his law that were not completely detailed out in the text, but they understood it. Why? Because it was written upon their hearts. Like I said, in the teaching of what was before Moshe, we need to understand that the principles of Yahweh's kingdom, in other words, there's instructions, guidelines, ordinances, judgments, decrees. These things existed before Mount Sinai and they were re-given at Mount Sinai. They were there from the very beginning, reiterated with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and again at Mount Sinai. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is why? The reason why it was reiterated was because the children of Israel had forgotten the very principles of the kingdom during their many years in bondage while they were living in Egypt, and they had, they had succumbed to the ways of the world. Do you blame them? No. This is what happens to so many people today, unfortunately. They were taken into slavery. So many people today choose to go into slavery. They choose to disregard Yahweh's Torah. They choose to backslide. Again, I need to state that, as we have already come to see, it's the mediator that changed. The parties between the agreements are still the same. And this is very, very important to understand. You see, once you understand covenant, the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic, and the bridal covenant, and you understand that all of Yahweh's covenants are progressive in nature, then you will come to see that the new covenant is truly a renewed covenant built with better promises. Yet the parties are still the same. And it's the same covenant just put in the right place now. It's placed within our hearts as we surrender to his Ruach and as we walk this life out through sanctification. Because at the end of days, the completeness of this covenant shall be fulfilled. 
We need to understand that certain parts of the covenant have not been fully completed yet, contrary to what many people are teaching. It has not been completed yet. Let's take a look at this new or renewed covenant. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 4 to 6, it says the following. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. You see, they are serving a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Why? Because it is the schoolmaster that leads us to Messiah Yeshua, who is the pattern, who is the reality of that pattern, if I have to put it that way. Then he goes on and he says, Just as Moshe was warned by Yahweh when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says that you make all things, everything, according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he, Messiah Yeshua, has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. Now, what we need to understand here is that Rabbi Sheol uses the same term in his letter to Timothy. He uses the same term and he says the same thing, that it's got to do with the mediator. He says the following in 1 Timothy 2, 5-6, Because of Yeshua's death and resurrection, he has now been able to become that mediator on our behalf. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 5-6, to it says, For there is one Elohim and one mediator also between Yahweh and men, the man Yeshua the Messiah, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Now, what's interesting is that the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a mediator as a person that mediates between parties at variance. In other words, the two parties here would have been who? Yahweh and his people Israel. The Erdman's Bible Dictionary makes the definition a little bit wider and it says, a person who stands between two parties to reconcile their differences or to establish a relationship between them. Isn't that exactly what Yeshua is doing? He's standing as the mediator to reconcile us to the Father and to 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 get rid of those differences. This is so so important. You see, through the death and resurrection of Messiah Yeshua, we now have a great high priest who stands not only as our priest, but also as the mediator, and he mediates the differences between us and Yahweh. And he also is there to establish a relationship between us and him. And he does this via, brothers and sisters, via his life. The life that he sacrificed for us as the full price of the redemption. His flesh tore so that we could be able to understand and, and comprehend what the whole thing is regarding the Holy of Holies. Furthermore, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, it says, For this reason he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. You see, the author of Hebrews already explained the point about the relationship. Yeshua can save all who draw near to Yahweh through him. It's not only for the people or the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, but through his death and resurrection, he draws all people near who confess their sins and acknowledge him as the Messiah. Now, when we break up this covenant, this, this renewed or new covenant, we come to see something very, very interesting. Not all of the promises of this covenant have been fulfilled yet. Because if you look at the passages of Scripture, or you look at it, you'll come to see that the following parts of the covenant, I believe, have not been fulfilled yet. Firstly, it says that they will all know Him and not teach each other. This has not been fulfilled yet. It goes on to say that they will sin no more. This has not been fulfilled yet. They will be gathered from the lands where they have been driven. This has not been fulfilled yet. They will dwell safely in the land. This has definitely not been fulfilled yet. It says that the righteous branch of David will spring forth and rule over his people. This has not happened yet. And it says that Yahweh will set his sanctuary in their midst forever. These things haven't happened yet, brothers and sisters. However, we have seen, brothers and sisters, that the death, the resurrection and the ascension of Yeshua did make a change. This is the only conclusion that we would be able to make is that it has been started and now this is where it gets very interesting. And I urge you to get the notes to see the references to everything that I am saying here. 
but it, it makes it very interesting because now we can understand that this covenant has been started, but it hasn't yet been established. It hasn't yet been fulfilled, come to an end. And this will not be the first time that a covenant is started before being established. Remember in part two, we spoke about what happened as Moshe went up and down the mountain. We spoke about how the people accepted and, and how the proposal was given. You see, the Sinai covenant, it promised that the Israelites would become Yahweh's people. But the question is, when did this happen? When did the commandments that were given at Sinai, when the commandments were given at Sinai, pardon me, and the blood was sprinkled, that is when, brothers and sisters, this initiated in. This is when this covenant began. But we recognize that Yahweh saw them as his people long before this event ever took place. Not so? This is very important. Now getting back to Book of the Covenant and what they teach. You know, what they are teaching at present is very much similar to what many Christian pastors teach. And pastors reconcile the Torah and the differences of the Torah and what we should keep and what we shouldn't keep in much the same way that they do. You see, many Christians argue that since Yeshua did not specifically state each commandment in the Torah that he intended for you and I to keep today, then we only have to abide by the ones that he specifically stated, which in reality then omits many, many instructions. See, those of us who understand what Yeshua came to do, those of us who understand I believe that we understand that he did not have to restate everything that was already written in the writings of Moshe. Why? Because the people could read the writings of Moshe for the complete listing. It's the same as if somebody stands up and gives a sermon. So often people give a sermon based on a few points. But it's the context that people need to understand. And I believe that Yahweh, and, and not only Yahweh, but Yeshua, pardon me, when he spoke, he understood that people would understand the context. And this is exactly what is happening in Acts chapter 15. You have the four rules, and many people have totally misunderstood that. And again, if you don't understand what's going on in Acts chapter 15, please go and listen to our teaching called Acts chapter 15. I'll put the link also below. And you see, this is exactly what was happening in Acts chapter 15. You see, once the Gentiles came to Yeshua, they had to stop their pagan rites and confess their sins. And then they were allowed to go into the synagogue each Shabbat. Why? Because it was inside the synagogue that they would hear the rest of the writings of Moshe and they would come to understand the importance of walking in Yahweh's Torah. Now something else that's very, very important to understand is that Yeshua himself said that if Abraham was our father, if Abraham was our father, that you and I would do the same things Abraham did. Yet today many are holding to the fact that they are walking in the Abrahamic covenant and that they are so-called priests in the order of righteousness, yet they are lacking the true works, the works that are supposed to be accompanied with walking in that priesthood. They failed to keep the Torah of Yahweh. You see, Yeshua came to do the works of His Father. He came to manifest the name of His Father. And He came to show us what that means. What does it mean to manifest the name of Yahweh? It means that when Yahweh's word abides in you, then you can ask according to his word and things will happen. Furthermore, Yaakov says, show me your faith and I will show you my works. What works is he talking about? You know, it is written that Abraham obeyed the laws, decrees, statutes and ordinances of Yahweh, as we said previously in Genesis chapter 26 verse 5. Now the question is, how did Abraham know what they were at that specific time? It was because Yahweh had spoken to him and taught him these principles of his kingdom. What we need to understand is that Abraham had the Torah written upon his heart. And this is why I believe, and Yahweh chose him. He chose him because of the condition of his heart. Knowing that Abraham would continue to teach Yahweh's laws, decrees and statutes to his children after him. Genesis eighteen nineteen, So that Yahweh would have a chosen people. You know, brothers and sisters, if we belong to Messiah, then according to scriptures, it says that we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. If Abraham is our father, then we would do the things Abraham did. Yet today, many are only doing half of these things. If you are doing the works of Abraham, then you will be doing the works of Yeshua, as they both kept Yahweh's Torah and they walked his Torah out perfectly in a generation of decay. They did the works of righteousness healing the sick, casting out demons, 
These are the things that we are supposed to be doing. We are supposed to be a light to the nations. Brothers and sisters, those who teach the commandments of Yahweh and hold to the testimony of Yeshua, they are those who are truly of Abraham's seed, I believe. And you know, Yeshua was so specific, (laughs) specific, who the father is of those who teach otherwise. And he said it. He said, your father, your father is the devil. Brothers and sisters, we need to wake up to the truth of Yahweh's word. Those holding to the Book of the Covenant and Book of the Law doctrine, they seem to have erroneously readopted the Christian way of reconciling the Scriptures. They seem to be implying that since all the principles of Yahweh's law are not specifically outlined before Exodus 24, then believers only have to follow the ones that are specifically outlined before Exodus 24. But then again, Today we are faced with Book of the Covenant, Book of the Law, but on the other spectrum, we are faced with those in the Hebraic Roots movement that don't seem to understand that the New Covenant will not be like the covenant that Yahweh made with the children of Israel when He brought them out of Egypt. Many in the Hebraic Roots movement do not seem to understand that the covenant at Mount Sinai, with all the earthly order of things, was for rebellious and stiff-necked people. It was for people who were struggling to comprehend that which was in the heavenlies. Those in the Hebraic Roots movement are also wanting and waiting for, other earth, for another earthly tabernacle. They're waiting for another earthly order of things, for the Levitical priesthood to be raised up again. And this actually shows that their minds are carnal and not set on earthly things, that they cannot comprehend the truth of Yahweh's word, and that they are not able to understand the heavenly principles and what has taken place on the day that Messiah Yeshua had his last supper with his disciples. You see, it shows that they have still not learned from the earthly tutor or schoolmaster and applied the principles to their lives today. They do not seem to understand what it means for Abraham to be our father. And they do not seem to understand that Abraham obeyed the principles, the, the Torah of Yahweh's kingdom. All of his laws, his decrees and his statutes, it was kept by Abraham. Yet at that time there was no earthly tabernacle, nor was there an earthly order of priests, the Levitical priesthood. Neither was there judges at the time of Abraham. You see, they do not seem to understand that Yahweh's laws were written in Abraham's heart. And they do not seem to understand that his spirit dwelt within Abraham rather than in an earthly tabernacle built with hands. Brothers and sisters, they don't seem to understand that if we belong to Messiah Yeshua, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. They also don't seem to understand the greater birth. In other words, what it really means to be born again. Born of the seed that is of the heavenlies. Born of the seed of the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Which is the greater order. Which is the greater offering. As well as the greater inheritance. The treasured inheritance. Now in Isaiah chapter 51, it's actually quite interesting because Yahweh asks, He asks those who pursue righteousness those who seek him, to listen to him. And he tells them to look to Abraham, their father, and Sarah, the one who bore them, not to look to the covenant made at Mount Sinai. Now let's take a note and have a look at what it says. Isaiah chapter 51. It says, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, seeking Yahweh. Look to the rock you were hewn from and to the hole of the pit you were dug from. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For he was alone when I called him and blessed him and increased him. For Yahweh shall comfort Zion, he shall comfort all her waste places. For he makes her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of Yahweh. Joy and gladness are found in it, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give ear to me, O my nation. For the Torah goes forth from me, and my right ruling I set as a light to peoples. My righteousness is near, my deliverance goes forth, and my arms judge people. Coastlands wait upon me. And for my arm they wait expectantly. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look to the earth beneath. For the heavens shall vanish like smoke and the earth wear out like a garment. And those who dwell in it die as gnats. But my deliverance is forever and my righteousness is not broken. Listen to me, you who do righteousness, a people in whose heart is my Torah. Do not fear the reproach of men nor be afraid of their revelings. For a moth eats them like a garment and a worm eats them like wool. But my righteousness is forever, and my deliverance to all generations. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of Yahweh. 
awake as in the day of old, everlasting generations. Was it not you who cut Rehob apart and pierced the crocodile? Now what we need to see in this passage of Scripture is that Yahweh tells them that a Torah, the Torah, His law will go forth from Him. Not that it will be nailed to the stake or half of it will be taken out of the way. No, He says that He will set His justice for a light to the people. His justice, brothers and sisters, is found within the very Torah. Now pay close attention to verse 7 and 8. Those who know righteousness have His Torah in their hearts. And he tells us not to fear the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revelings. And he explains that the moth will eat them up like a garment, and the worm will eat them like wool. But his righteousness will be forever, and his salvation to all generations. And then he says, awake, awake, and put on strength. You see, brothers and sisters, this is why abiding in Yeshua is the key to overcoming. When we live and walk in Him, that's when His Torah, all of it, will be written on our hearts. Not just a part of it or just a little piece of it and the rest nailed to the stake. No. The problem with this teaching of Book of the Covenant, Book of the Law, brethren, is that it fails to give the full message of Messiah at this present time. And the full message is that Yahweh is looking for sons and daughters of righteousness. And you know, the single biggest problem on this earth today, brothers and sisters, is unrepentance. The fact that the world is slipping into an abyss no more does man have any regard for the law of Elohim and for the image of Yahweh in their fellow man. And it's for this reason I believe that Abba Father is raising up a remnant, a people after his own heart. A people who will not walk by the flesh, but that will walk by his Ruach and have his Torah written on their hearts. And we need to understand that this doesn't happen overnight. This happens by growing up from being a child to being a true son and daughter. This will also not happen if you disregard part of Yahweh's word. And I've already spoken about the cost of being a priest of righteousness in previous teachings. We cannot expect that just because we saved that we automatically become a priest. You see, the message of Elijah is a message of repentance and a message of outcalling proclamation to wayward house of Israel. It's to call Israel back to a right relationship with Yahweh, to show the world that Yahweh is the one true Elohim. Brothers and sisters, if you haven't come to understand it yet, this isn't just going to happen. It's going to take some drastic, drastic measures. You see, the true priesthood will be of those, those that are walking in the perfect will of Elohim, those who are spiritually mature, and they are radiating Him. I believe that they will be the messages of reconciliation, but also the pronouncers of Yahweh's judgments and justice in this generation. See, how can we be these messengers? How can we be part of this final remnant? If we don't understand the shadows of the old and the importance of covenant. More importantly, we need to understand who Elohim really is. We need to understand who He is. We need to understand His character, His love, His righteousness, His justice. I believe that those who form part of this final remnant they are being used and changed and renewed and, and, and built up in this time so as to be used by Yeshua as judges in the thousand year reign. Which is another thing that those that hold to the book of the covenant, book of the law seem to twist. The whole understanding of the thousand year reign. Brothers and sisters, the message of Elijah is the crux of everything. The message of Elijah is indeed the message of the end time remnant. The call to repentance. It's a call to repent, to teshuva, to return to the ways of Yahweh and to choose which magistrate we will serve. In other words, what Elohim will you serve? Go and do a word study on the word Elohim and you'll come to see that it also means magistrate. And you see, this, this latter aspect is a key proclamation which is present in each and every single one of the covenants. And the proclamation is the following, that I will be your God. I will be your Elohim. I will be your magistrate, H430, and you will be my people. I will be your judge. I will do right ruling among you. This is what he said to Abraham. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be magistrate to you, H430. 
and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings and the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their magistrate. Go and read it like that and see how important this is to understand it. We've already spoken about Abraham and the fact that Abraham was so different. Yahweh told Abraham to walk before him and to be Tamim. H8549, to walk in all of his commandments, in his decrees, his statutes, his ordinance. You see, brothers and sisters, what he's actually saying to him is he's saying, hey, you know what, Abraham, I will be your magistrate. I will, I will do right ruling over you and you and everyone else shall be my people. Furthermore, to the children of Israel, he said, I will walk among you. And will be your magistrate. I will walk among you and be your Elohim. And you shall be my people. Leviticus 26.12 Jeremiah 7.23 Then in the new covenant he says, For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Not, not now, after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their magistrate. I will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. Brothers and sisters, this is important stuff to understand. Now, while Abraham and Sarah seemed to understand what it meant for Yahweh to be their magistrate, to be their judge, so many people today do not understand what that means. You see, many people today continue to allow the principles of this world to be the standard by which they measure themselves. And Rabbi Shul says, don't do that. If you're going to do anything, test yourself according to Yahweh's Torah. Don't test yourself according to your teacher. Don't test yourself according to your fellow believer. Test yourself according to my principles, my guidelines. You know, many today, they continue to allow celebrities, famous musicians, actors, all kinds of people, brothers and sisters, to set the standard for how they are supposed to live and have a moral standard. This is seeping right into the Messianic and Hebrew roots movement. That is why today when people ask me, I disassociate myself with that. Because today within the Messianic movement, people are using traditions and doctrines of men to be the standards by which they judge and measure themselves, others, and their level of righteousness. These people, brothers and sisters, have seen, or not seen, they have. They are forgetting and they are turning a deaf ear to Yahweh's eternal principles. You see, if Yahweh is truly our magistrate, then his principles alone should be the standard by which we, as his people, learn to judge and measure ourselves by our behavior and the way that we walk. Again, I want to say thank you to your fellow brother and sister in the faith that have Help me. You know, like I say, as we come together and we refine our thoughts, the message of Yahweh grows and the message of Yahweh carries more weight. And I am not, I am not one of those that believes that I am a man all on my own. Yes, I pray, I speak to Yahweh, Yahweh speaks to me many, many things. But it's good to come together and refine our thoughts, especially on this book of the covenant, book of the law. It's very, very important to get a clear understanding and to walk the road that is set before us. Now to Moshe, Yahweh had to introduce himself as the magistrate of his forefathers, as the Elohim of his forefathers. The Elohim of Abraham and the Elohim of Isaac and the magistrate of Jacob. It's important that we put it as the magistrate because he is the righteous judge. It is who he really is. And the question is why? Why did he have to reintroduce himself to them? Because they had forgotten him and his character. Moshe had forgotten who Yahweh was. He had forgotten his character, his power and authority. Likewise, it was necessary for Elijah to do the same, to come to the people of Israel and reintroduce Yahweh as a magistrate, as a righteous judge. Because they had forgotten him. They had forgotten his character, his power, and his authority. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I pray, and, and I'm going to ask this, this question. I pray that you're seeing what the role of the end time Elijah is going to be. That there will be a reintroduction to this awesome magistrate on a global level. That Yahweh is going to raise up a remnant of people that will understand all these things and they will go out to reintroduce the world to this righteous judge. This judge that shows, shows mercy and righteousness and love. But at the same time that will show justice upon the earth for every single person that chooses to walk contrary to his word. 
Now, while people have substituted the word Elohim for God in the scriptures, the meaning of magistrate remains lost. You see, to be our magistrate is to be our judge, our lawgiver. It's kind of like looking at it as your president. And this is critical for people to understand what it means to be in covenant with him and to understand the importance of walking by all of his laws, decrees, statutes and ordinances because he is the magistrate that has given us this law. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand that our magistrate has laws that govern his kingdom. If you want to be part of his kingdom, then you need to be keeping those laws. Many are obeying his Torah without the Spirit, and that's a bad, bad place to be. His laws were always intended to be followed with a whole heart and with a right spirit, with a circumcised heart. That is why it says in Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Deuteronomy 10, 12 to 13. And now, Israel, what does Yahweh your magistrate require of you but to fear Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve Yahweh who is your magistrate with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of Yahweh, which I am commanding you today for your good. Deuteronomy 10, 16. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. This day Yahweh your magistrate commands you to do these statutes and rules. You shall therefore be careful to do them with all your heart and with all your soul. Deuteronomy 26.16 I'm sure that you can see from all of this, brothers and sisters, that it seems then, and I don't believe that it just seems, I believe that it is. One of the duties of the end time remnant is going to be to reintroduce Yahweh as this great and awesome magistrate. This magistrate of Abraham, the magistrate of Isaac, and the magistrate of Israel. The magistrate, brothers and sisters, of this entire world. You know, to explain that Yahweh is our magistrate or our judge, the righteous judge, the just judge and the impartial judge, the judge who is full of mercy and who has the foundation and his throne, which is built on righteousness and justice, is going to take some serious drastic measures. This is why, brothers and sisters, we should not be living according to the principles of the world. Rather, if He truly is our Elohim, then we should learn to live according to all of His commandments. And we should learn to apply the principles of His kingdom now, so that when we live and rule and reign with Him in a thousand years, that we will understand all of this. We should be doing these things not with half a heart, but with a whole heart. Now I'd like us to take a look as we have been discussing and saying the importance of the shadow. If we do not understand types and foreshadows, then we will never actually understand what happened on the night of Yeshua's death, the night of what is commonly referred to as the Last Supper. I covered this in the Ezekiel teaching as well as in um, the, the Elijah teaching. And I pray that you will come to understand how important it is that we study the earthly structure of things, how the earthly priests worked and how everything fitted together. If we don't, we are going to miss the patterns in the New Testament. We are going to miss the types and foreshadows throughout Scripture. You see, in order to understand what occurred on the night before Yeshua's death, it's critical for you and I to be familiar with the earthly order of things. We need to understand the tabernacle. We need to understand its furnishings, which we're going to look at at part 4 and part 5. We need to understand the altar and what the altar meant. But we also need to understand the role of the priesthood as well as the judges, those who acted on behalf of Yahweh among the people. And in order to understand much of Yeshua's words and actions, it is critical to be familiar with this whole concept and this whole idea of the order of things, the earthly order. Because these things, brothers and sisters, these things were given to serve as a shadow, a pattern of what exists in the heavenlies. And that is why I said it previously, that the writer of the book of Hebrews understands this and uses everything to his gain as he teaches. And it should still be like that today. And let's take a look at the consecration of the earthly priests to understand the importance of the shadow. And unfortunately, I didn't have time to put it all on the screen, but what we need to understand is the following. And I'm going to read it to you. This is exactly how earthly priests were consecrated. And this is how they had to do, and what they had to do, pardon me, 
in order to begin their service. And you can read about it in Leviticus chapter 8. The Bible says that Aaron and his sons, in other words, those born of his seed, were brought to the door, the door of the tabernacle. And it's here that they washed with water, found in Leviticus chapter 8 verse 6. And they were clothed in linen priestly garments. They had to put on new garments, Leviticus 8.13. Unleavened bread was placed in their hands and they were waved as a wave offering. In other words, as a first fruit offering, Leviticus 8.27. We also know that some of the blood was put on the right ear and on the thumb of their right hands and on the big toes on their right feet, Leviticus 8.24. Also, their garments were sprinkled with some of the blood, Leviticus 8.30. Very, very significant. They ate of ram and unleavened bread at the door, Leviticus 8.31. Now what we need to understand and what we need to remember is that at the Last Supper, at this, at this, what is commonly referred to as the Last Supper, Messiah Yeshua said, what I am doing now, you will not understand now, but you will understand at a later time. Now we need to pay attention to what was actually happening. And he said, you, do not, you will not understand what is taking place now, but at a later time you shall. So you and I need to understand these things. Firstly, we said in, in the consecration of the Levitical priests that they were brought to the door. We need to understand, brothers and sisters, that he brought the disciples to himself. He is the door. The scriptures say that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way in. And remember, they were priests because they were born again. They were born again of his seed. Messiah Yeshua overturns all of these birthrights. He overturns them so that we may inherit with him. This is so important to understand. Furthermore, he washed them. And what we need to take note of is that he only washed their feet. He washes, pardon me, I thought I had another slide. He only washes their feet. And he washes only their feet at this time. Why? Because they were already clean by the speaking of, his, of the word that was spoken to them. The living water, the living word. That he had spoken to them. Now we also know that he had been clothing them in garments of salvation. And that the priests had to change their garments. Which is a picture of putting on Messiah Yeshua. Messiah Yeshua had been clothing them in garments of salvation and righteousness. How? By saving them and by turning their lives. Helping them to turn around. To learn no longer to sin. And to show them how to walk in the Father's ways. Both by the Spirit of Yahweh and in all the truth. That was given to them. Furthermore, we know that unleavened bread was placed in the hands of the Levitical priest and that it was waved as a wave offering, a type of first fruit. When we look at what was happening with Messiah Yeshua, we see that he took the bread and he put it in their hands. He placed it in their hands. He then took the wine and said that it was the blood of the covenant and Messiah didn't drink of it. When you understand, as we have spoken about in the Jewish wedding, then you will understand the concept of what's going on. That final cup is only drunk at the consummation of the wedding. That is why, brothers and sisters, the final cup will be drunk by the bride and Messiah Yeshua in the heavenlies at the end of time. Furthermore, we'll look at a, another, a, another revelation, if I have to put it that way, concerning that wine. They also ate the meal which included ram and unleavened bread. That's what they were eating when they were sitting at the table. So brothers and sisters, we can clearly see that it seems, and, and I wouldn't say that it seems, that it is that Messiah Yeshua is now the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. He had already been mikvahed by Yochanan so that he could have that, that role. And, and Caiaphas had already tore his garments. And pardon me, not already, he was about to tear his garments. But he had already been mikvahed by Yochanan. And, and that is why it's so important to understand what is taking place here. Because right now, he's completely following the protocol of consecrating the disciples as becoming those ministers of reconciliation. The priests in the order of righteousness. Not of the order of this earth, but of the order of Melchizedek. And we need to understand that the transference was taking place right here. Again, and, and, and I, I would like to urge you for more on this, please go and listen to the full Ezekiel series to get a fuller understanding. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand something. The schoolmaster is the tutor. It is the tutor that is showing us the fulfillment in Messiah Yeshua. It is the tabernacle, the priesthood, all the earthly furnishings, everything that has been given to us. It is pointing us to the 
heavenly reality, which is Messiah Yeshua. And now that he came, we are now able to look at the shadow and apply it to our lives so that we can become the true sons and daughters of inheritance. Brothers and sisters, I really pray that you will come to understand how to apply each and everything that is presented appropriately in your life. I said that in part five, we're going to be touching on specifically, we're going to be looking at the ark and we're going to look at the trespass offering. This is one thing that many, many believers do not understand. They understand how to apply the, the, tres, uh, uh, the sin offering to their lives, but they don't seem to understand how to apply the trespass offering. Why did Yeshua come and say when he prayed, he said, Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Why did he say that? Why is it so important that we understand how to apply the trespass offering now that we are walking in the renewed covenant? How do we then apply the understanding of the trespass offering when we offend our brothers or sisters, when we offend one another? How do we apply these things? We're going to be looking at that as we go along. So I pray that you will join me for part four as we take a look at the earthly tabernacle furnishings in relation to Messiah Yeshua. And I believe that it will be a true eye-opener and help you to understand the importance of the schoolmaster, the importance of the shadow, and how to take everything that the Father has given us in His Word and apply it to our lives. Brothers and sisters, this isn't anymore about this cookie-cut division. This is about maturing. This is about growing up. This is about becoming the true sons and daughters. I have always spoken and taught on the remnant, and that is where my heart is. I believe that those who listen, obey, and apply, they shall be changed and renewed and built up in Messiah Yeshua so that they can become a living testimony and a true son and daughter of inheritance in this final generation. So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you and glorify you. Father, I want to lift up your name above every other name and just say thank you. Thank you, Father, for your greatness. Thank you, Father, for your love, for your enduring love and your mercy. Thank you that you are the magistrate that does justice and right ruling, that we can come to you and that you are a refuge for us, that you are the strong tower. Father Yahweh, I want to thank you in the name of Yeshua for your goodness and your mercy. I want to thank you for your word. And I pray in the name of Yeshua that your word shall go forth like a mighty thunderous voice. And Father, that every ear shall hear, that every tongue shall confess that Messiah Yeshua is the Messiah of mankind. Father Yahweh, we are excited for 2017. We are excited for the great things that you are about to do upon this earth. As you raise your children up, Father, to go forth and proclaim the message of reconciliation like no eye has ever seen before. Father, your word says in Matthew chapter 24 that this gospel, the gospel, the true gospel of the kingdom of Messiah Yeshua shall be proclaimed as a witness to all nations. And Father, I don't believe that the true gospel message has totally been proclaimed yet. I pray, Father, that the true message, the message of redemption, the message of your Torah, the message of maturity, and the message of becoming the righteousness of Yahweh upon this earth, becoming those sons and daughters, shall be proclaimed with great zeal, with great determination, and with a great fire. Father Yahweh, I pray a blessing over each and every person that has joined me today. Father, may you bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them and give them peace. Shalom in Yeshua's name. Amen. I really want to thank you for joining me. I pray that you will come back for part four and part five. And I pray that you will continue to walk as Messiah Yeshua desires you to walk. That you will strive to be holy. That you will strive to be mature. That you will learn to lay your life down on a daily basis. And that he will infuse you with his power and his spirit. So that when you pray and when you do things, that you will have a life-changing experience. A true encounter with the living Elohim will leave you changed. You will never be the same again. I pray that He will bless you, that He will guide you, that He will take your weak hand and put it in His strong hand, and that you will know that He's always with you, leading you and guiding you. I invite you to please subscribe to this channel by hitting the subscribe button. By subscribing, you help us to get these teachings out to more. Please, if you like this 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 teaching, give it a thumbs up. By thumbs up picking the teachings, it also helps us to get it out to more people. I'd also like to invite you to head over to www, www, 
www sounds good www.treasuredinheritanceministry.com where you can get all of our teachings and become a member and in, enjoy all the things that are presented on that website so head over to www.treasuredinheritanceministry.com and i thank you again for joining me and i look forward to spending part four and part five with you i believe that that is going to be the meat of this entire series and it's the part that i'm looking forward to the most so again blessings to you blessings to your family shalom Thank you.